Okay, thank you. So um, I'll try not to make sure that we hit anything from redundancy. And I put where we're at in 2020 because we're almost there and this is an incredibly unregulated area. Um, I, um, it's not something I routinely do at all, this technology, but I've really followed this a lot because we've had a lot of clinicians in our community of Colorado that have played and marketed heavily into stem cells. But before we really get to there, I think the key is why are we even talking about disc regeneration? And what, when do patients even have that? So I wanna spend the first few minutes kind of hashing in some of the things that we talked about. Is that we really rely today on an MRI scan to help us understand what the anatomy looks like and what does a disc look like? And it's our job as a clinician to try to determine is this normal, such as this is a 45-year-old patient on the left, a 60-year-old patient on the right, and which of these is symptomatic and which of these is abnormal, which of these is a normal aging process, and can we really inject things or modify tissues in these discs to make a difference? Or are we restrained to do mechanical technology like we'll talk about in the lab? And I think that's always the big challenge is what is really significant and what is really age related. I think this is one of a, a great study that a friend of mine, Ken Chung, did um, in Hong Kong where they looked at one of the largest series, 1,500 Chinese volunteers. They did an MRI of their whole spine and they looked at degeneration. Now what we can find from this is that they looked at a variety of things. The magnitude of the degeneration, the number of levels they had associated with age to try to give us some idea of which one of these groups of patients really had back pain associated with these findings. This is kind of what they found when you look at changes with age for HIZ zones and disc herniations and Smarls nodes. So over time, the disc herniations kind of stay about the same because we see maybe disc herniations more in the 30s and 40s, but we still see them in the patients in the fifth decade and younger. The Smarls nodes stay the same, but the HIZ changes just clearly increase with age. So that's a normal, clearly defined 1,500 volunteer MRIs of looking at those changes. When you look at the number of levels that someone has that's degenerative, the number of levels, it's very unique that it clearly goes up. If you look at greater than 50, you have a whole group of patients that have one level, two levels, three levels, four levels, five levels. But as you're younger, it's more common to see these patients with one level disease. So what does all this really mean? Well. It has everything to do with the relationship between the MRI and the severity of their back pain. What they found from looking at 1,500 patients, the largest series, the more severe the degeneration, the higher proportion of the patients with back pain. So there actually is some correlation with these MRI findings um, and associated with symptoms. But why is this concept important? Well, we all know that age-related changes are normal. We all know that degenerative disc disease some, in some subsets of patients need treatment because they think it's a true impairment in their life and not just an annoyance. But what we did find is that the more severe forms of the degeneration, it's more likely it's more likely that that isn't truly the cause of the patient's symptoms. That's probably what we can grade. We've all seen this scale right here. And it's always amazing to me that where in this scale do you put stem cells? Where in this scale do we do a fusion? Where in this scale is it best to do a mechanical disc replacement or intradiscal steroids? Or where can we change them? And so let's just briefly talk about what really happens. What I always find amazing is the people that really believe in the stem cells and things have never seen inside of a disc. They really have never understand how a um, cellular this structure really is. Because over time, these particular structures in the disc, they lose all their nutrients. It's probably the largest acellular environment in a human body. It has really low water content. It changes in its type one and two collagen, and you see all these structures. And a lot of it is because the nodal cord cells disappear really when you get to adult life, as you can see here in the lower um, microscopic film compared to the one at 13 years of age. So it's an incredibly acellular environment. It has very low oxygen tension carrying capacity. And it's probably a great cemetery to inject a lot of cells that just can never, ever survive. 
And that's how I look at it when I talk to patients. They come to me and say, Mike, should I get this stem cell injection in my disc? And I always tell them they have two options. They can go buy a new truck or they can get these stem cell injections. It costs the same and probably does the same thing for their back. And so I try to help put that into perspective on really what their best option is. Because I tell them that the disc itself is probably the largest avascular area in your body. It's really dependent on diffusion. And most cells just can't survive if we try to inject them. It looks similar to this. And I tell them that it's a, it's a, a slightly acidic area. There's a lot of degrading enzymes. There's a lot of uh, breakdown products. And the nutrition is quite poor. Even though we want to reverse this, it is the largest structure that has vascular supply issues. Now, we talked a little bit ago about inflammatory mediators. And when we take a look, these are all the causes of chemical issues of pain and back pain. And we take a lot of anti-inflammatories and oral steroids and we inject steroids and do things to try to control some of the prostaglandins, the higher nitric acids. All of these things are really part of the cascade of this degenerative condition. And you can play with this of taking a look at all of these cytokines have all been identified uh, at different times in the disc degenerative process. Because it's this whole, uh, I tell patients that some people get 80 years of life or 80,000 miles out of their disc and some people only get 20. And, and, and some of it's mechanics, some of it's genetics, some of it's this whole cascade of this uh, cartilage anabolic activity that occurs. And when they, you help them understand that, it's hard to think that, that the intradiscal stem cells in these injections are going to make a huge difference in this. We've been through this process of intradiscal technologies where we burn the disc called intradiscal thermal electroannuloplasty. If I recall, this was FDA approved in a shoulder capsule by a very small subset of cases, patients, and then it was sold to Smith the Nephews, and this, uh, Dr. Saul and his brother really advocated this type of technology, and it never, ever went anywhere. And it was some sham studies that we evaluated. We found mechanical ways to manipulate the disc. It didn't quite work. When I first started in my career in the 90s, we were doing YAG and homium laser treatments to the disc. That didn't work either. Then we went to the laser spines, and you've seen those, as well as these injections of chymopapain into the disc with chemicals. That didn't work either. So I think we're on a different wave as we take a look at how these things can work. Now, we have a good understanding of how BMPs work for bone formation. It's a very commercially available product. Yes, there's been a lot of risks associated with it. Um, it's been FDA approved for one clear indications in inner body fusions in the front of taking these metachymal cells, manipulating that with some differentiation, proliferation, and now you get this intramembranous ossifications through osteoblasts. But the BMPs are also tried to be isolated with these cell technologies when you're trying to do disc regeneration. You take the mesenchymal cells, you're trying to change these with fibroblasts, and then moving on to these proteoglycans and collagen fibers, at least in theory. But there's a whole cascade of these BMPs that go from 1 to 18 with, with the uh, polypeptides. And the goal is to find ways that maybe we can take these, uh, these tissues. And I think it may have roles in tennis elbow and rotator cuff and partial Achilles tendons. But in real high avascular environments, the concentrations of even the blood supply in healthy discs is so scant, it's going to be challenging. So these are the number of publications that you can find today on BMPs for disc regenerations of taking a look at just BMP2. There's very minimal. There's about five studies in vitro and about uh, two in vivo, and I won't go through them all. But the key here of taking a look at some of these in rat, human and rat studies is that they primarily just show that there's an increase in collagen release and an increase in the prostaglandin release. And that's about what you can find when you're looking for disc regeneration utilizing BMP2. At the same time, when you look at it in vivo, and there's the mouse and bovine studies, it's fairly consistent. Here's just two examples from one of the studies that I found with and without BMP, and you can see how the cellular levels have changed inside the disc, but is it really sustainable? Do these models represent the human more avascular disc than these young, uh, either mouse or bovine is in question? But it's got problems, and all the studies will tell you they have issues of disc fibrosis, disc ossification with using BMP2 into the disc, 
and heterotopic ossification and does it create a spontaneous fusion? So I don't really think it's something we're going to probably see in human clinical trials. BMP7, very small number of studies utilizing it for disc regeneration. Most of them in vitro, very small in vivo, and it kind of shows a kind of a BMP7. The key across there with 7 is it's all a higher increase in prostaglast gland and synthesis is really what has been shown in most of the animal studies using BMP7. Same thing we saw. You can see the cellular changes between prostaglandin, and that's kind of where the direction is, and it has the exact same risk factors we saw with BMP2, heterotopic ossification. Some of them were spontaneous fusions in animals, and it may have some cytotoxic effects they felt, at least in the animal studies, due to the high dosage of the kidneys. Now, there's another cascade of BMPs that have been tried into the disc space, which is 4, 6, and 12, and there is, is almost no publications whatsoever. They just are scant articles. There's a few abstracts that tried to say how these were used in a variety of different models, but they never really put any of these together, So, and it's even more difficult to figure out how to isolate them. So how would you conclude all the BMP stuff for discs? The literature would suggest that maybe there's a high potential for seven in the future, probably in two, very experimental in most of the other BMPs upon looking at it. But the conclusion of all the BMPs is the same, is the concerns of spontaneous fusion using it in the disc, uncontrolled release, and really there's just no cells for it to really work on in its overall indications. But this is where we're at today is that today with stem cells and platelet-rich plasma is that it's really being used in all types of places, not just for sports and for chronic pain, for skin, for back, for collagens, and it's a very, it's a takeoff. And I open up the paper all the time in Denver and see Stem Cells of America, a big company, and I go to those symposiums. My wife gets pissed because I take time off and I sit there in the audience and the average age is 75 in there, so I'm a little on the younger side. And I usually take my fellow and I was telling Jack, he sits on one side of the room and I sit on the other and I text him back and forth what questions to ask. So we're you know, having this discussion. In our state, it's interesting that the person that puts on all of these shows um, or presentations, um, they don't really tell you much about their qualifications. They talk about, I was in one of the symposiums and they said, no questions. You can't ask any questions at all, okay? You can't disrupt the guy given the presentation. So the doc gives this presentation and it shows this terribly arthritic knee on the left. It shows almost a completely normal knee on the right. And he told me he treated these with stem cells. I said, whoa, 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 that's not even the same patient. And he says, I'm sorry, no question. I go, that wasn't a question, it's a statement. That's fraudulent, it's not the same patient. And so that's what we've seen and how we get it. And what's happening in Colorado is that they're run by chiropractic physicians, own the clinics for Stem Cells of America, and they hire nurse practitioners and family docs to aspirate it and inject all their patients for them because they can't do it in their own state. But they're all $10,000 per injection. It's not covered by anything, and it's really this trend going across the country, but you really have to dig down to find out who's doing all of this work. And so that's this process. They're finding all types, and the big money maker is injecting this into the discs, into the facet joints, and uh, to the annulus, and doing this a reparative uh, mechanism. So let's talk just briefly about allogenic, autogenous, and some chondrocytes, and where is the real literature? These are the items, if you ask yourself, the key question number one, does allogenic work, and what's the effectiveness for allogenic uh, cell-based therapy for disc disease? There's been a couple things. It was a randomized control <laughs> trial published by Noriga, you can see there, and they really didn't show any real improvement and difference between that of the sham. And there was another one published by Cork in 2013 on chondrocytes using this allogenic, and there wasn't much benefit whatsoever. So then this is just kind of a busy summary, but if you look at the sham and the study of this using an allogenic-based therapy, there really was no difference whatsoever in either of these studies. It's the same as taking a look in here. This is just a summary of the outcomes, and I'll show you where you can get all these. All these are kind of tied up in one AO Spine Knowledge Forum paper that we that was published in, um, in the Global Spine Journal um, to do. And then if you take a look, this is looking at the safety and the conclusion then for allogenic. There was no major adverse events. There was very sparse safety data. It probably, they demonstrated a little bit less anti-inflammatories and narcotics, but yet 20% of them end up with a lumbar total disc surgery or fusion within 12 months that were all involved in any of these clinical trials. 
Then there's a whole realm for key question number two is, well, what if we use otogalus-based cell therapy? Dr. Centeno in 2017, he published his. He was also from Colorado. He was, um, I was asked to be on the board of a company that they were doing fat stem cells and bone marrow aspirates, and they were manipulating them, growing them in their own office, and then the patient would come back two weeks later and give it back to them. And I said, this is crazy. So. My wife is one of the inspectors for the FDA as a, as a pathologist in hematology, so we actually reported it. And they closed them down and they moved their office to um, the Caymans. So I saw him recently at a meeting and he was a little pissed because I, you know, I was a whistleblower and said, this is a bunch of crap. He goes, Mike, I really appreciate you helping me by closing me down because now that we're in the Caymans, all the money comes to the Caymans. We don't have to take our money out. All the patients are coming there. So it's actually turned out more lucrative for them than when they were doing these procedures in Denver. And and Ken Patin, who was in, was in Colorado also at the bottom there, he published a variety, uh, this in 2015, um, utilizing uh, this for degenerative disc disease. But he, did he was the only one that published that the ODI in these patients actually improved. Otherwise, they stayed relatively the same. This is a whole group of taking a look at the ODI for the improvements. And I put listed all the authors right here from 2011 through 2017. So slight improvement, no real control over these. Most of these were mesenchymal cells, and they had a little bit difference in the origin. But it's, again, it's a totally, we went through so much work to run disc replacement trials that this is the most uncontrolled um, frontier that we see currently in spine um, for the momentum, because patients are willing to pay for it, and we don't have to deal with insurance companies. So in summary on these studies, I got one more, I'm sorry. Whoop. Oh, 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 what did I do here? Did I hit the... I'm sorry. Can you maybe give me a hand here? I must have hit the wrong button. All right, so let's just go back to wherever we were here. I'm not very good at this. We're gonna go right back to here. Out here? Okay, we're right back to where we were. There we go. I'm so sorry I hit the wrong button. I was so excited about this technology. And so the outcomes, if you take a look, this was kind of the baseline. Most of them generated about 50, 60% maybe was the delta up to a year from having these injected into the disc um, for autogenous therapy. Um, and then we talked a little bit about safety. I'm going to catch up here. So the third thing is the effectiveness of hemopoietic cells and chondrocytes. There hasn't been a lot of studies. This was a small case series published almost 10 years ago, and most of them had uh, previous surgery. They used it for degenerative disc disease, and then you've never heard anything of this subset of patients whatsoever again. There's been a couple studies published on the effectiveness of chondrocyte-based therapy. Um, there's some ongoing current randomized clinical trials. Um, it's not uh, really been discussed much more in the peer review literature, but there is a consensus that this may be an alternative also because there's a concern that the chondrocytes can live in a much more um, uh, avascular environment and low oxygen tension carrying capacity to what we have seen. And so that's kind of the direction. So what would you... The conclusions really is there has been no difference in function in any of these studies and patients. There's been a slight improvement in ODI. There's been a slight improvement in pain. And there's been a uh, compared to uh, the, the, the controls in all of these groups. And the best thing to do is if you really want to research this and study it, is this is probably the best article today that was published. It was a knowledge form um, in Spine that looked at cell therapy for the treatment of, of intervertebral disc disease of looking at all of the literature that's currently available. It'll probably give you the overall best summary that's currently available to take a look that we kind of overviewed. So I think summary of the literature, the quality of evidence is very low for safety and efficacy for degenerative disc disease. That when you use allogenic, otogalus, or chondrocytes, there is a proposed to restore the nucleus in a very acellular, extracellular matrix. And patine, 
who doesn't practice anymore, was in Colorado, only report, the only one that reported any functional improvement in true ODI improvements in all of those patients. Um, there is a safety issue for an immune reaction in the allergenic groups, and cell viability and nutrition and cellular death are all still biggest concern. But the biggest target market are the vulnerable patients. And what do I mean by that? It's these elderly patients that are looking for the golden nugget to be 20 years younger. And this is a site that I mentioned earlier, and I'm not just picking on one, and this is one of them, because I've had two patients travel there in Chicago called True Stem Cell Therapy, and they advertise that they take cells from the iliac crest and they in, put them through the nasal cavity and do it under just local like a afferent spray, and they treat rheumatoid arthritis, type 2 diabetes, stroke, Parkinson's, Alzheimer, COPD, wound healing, inflammatory bowel disease, limb ischemia, and low back pain, all with the same injection. And it's about 20 grand done. It's all done just with the nasal spray that goes through. They say they squirt some mannitol up the nasal first. And so I checked into it a fair amount. I called him and talked to it. And not to pick on anybody, he's an ENT surgeon. They tell me he's triple board certified, does all this in his office, that's his lab. And he does cosmetic surgery, plastic surgery, but this is 100% of their business today. And the, and the patients that I know that have gone there tell me they had to wait six weeks to even get in. And so it's a huge business. It's totally unregulated today in all of these aspects. When I tell somebody that one treatment through your nose is going to treat um, rheumatoid arthritis, diabetes, stroke, all these things, it's kind of like the guy on the fair that's got one bottle of this medicine and is going to treat you for everything. And so really science is going backwards, but the FDA has zero radar on all of this. So I think it's just truly amazing. We've seen this concept in platelet-rich plasmas being injected into the disc, and I've operated on a number of these patients that have had this done. They've sacrificed their home, they've sold their cars and things to come up with enough money, and then they don't even have enough money to pay their deductible to have a definitive operation. And sometimes the inside of the disc looks like just a bunch of dead cells. And I think that's the reason that some of these fails, we're not for sure which ones to put it in. Um, I've also seen a number of patients that have gone to this place and had fiber and glue injected. And Jack tells me there's someone in Texas that does this a lot and has and injects multiple levels at one time with fiber and glue into the disc space. And they charge, I think it's twelve or fourteen thousand dollars per disc level to have that done. If you go to their site, this is their success. They say they got the patients with the top left with these disc herniations, and then here it's how it's cured on the right. And you can see it back and left. This is at one year following um, uh, injections into the disc with fibrin glue. We see there's another couple of their examples that they post that 12 months later, how this particular problem was completely resolved with injecting a fibrin glue into the disc space. So, and this is, I mean, and the, the cost for this is more than even doing an open micro disc. If you're spending 15 grand for a fiber and glue injection, you know, at our surgery center, it's uh, five grand to have a micro disc for the hospital stay. And here's another classic example on their same site uh, of doing fiber and glue, demonstrating that in their opinion that this is a two follow-up MRIs on how this cures these patients with disc pathology. So where are we really at today? We're not solved. There's a lot of research to be done. We don't know when to intervene. We don't know who to intervene. We don't know where the real aging process is. We know we're dealing with the largest avascular, toxic, acellular, low oxygen tension carrying capacity in the body. And there's a lot of issues of disc regenerations, tissue engineering that makes it a multifactorial process. We don't know how to control all the inflammatory process. We don't know a lot about cell viability, nutritional supply, whether PRP injections are going to work. Work. And these are all of the treatments that we currently have for nucleus interventions when patients have symptomatic disease. You know, we don't really have good ideas for repair and replacement or tissue engineering and mechanic. We have mechanical devices and we have medications. And uh, the rest of the cascade is everything else what patients are really looking for today as we try to come up with better strategies. Thank you.